morning, everybody. Uh, it's a little difficult for those of you that are here for the, the my surgery talk. It's a little difficult to follow a 20 year data set in a, uh, <laughs> a charismatic species like the white surgery. But I hope you find alligator guard at the October 2nd. So, uh, yeah, like, like, he's, like um, Sean said, uh, I want to talk about a, a budding project. It's actually, we're three years into the, the project right now. Um, involving anglers in our management of fish with alligator gar. I uh, just want to acknowledge my co authors this morning on this talk Dan Ash, he's one of our district biologists in Eastern Texas. So, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with alligator gar, uh, they're a native Texan uh, found in the fossil records in the Permian Basin from a little over 200 million years ago. And you can see from the picture, uh, they haven't changed much uh, in the Million year time period. Uh, they're found obviously throughout our fresh water and uh, river and reservoir systems, but they're also um, found throughout our, our brackish water and even uh, quite saline uh, bay systems as well, about, up to about 15 parts per thousand are quite abundant. Um, they're a periodic reproductive life history strategist, and that's just a fancy way, obviously, of saying that they, they don't spawn every year, kind of like the white sturgeon successfully. So uh, they live a long time, 60 plus year longevity that's been validated via bond radiocarbon, though we believe that there are probably uh, 90 plus year old fish out there, maybe even centenarians. Um, and uh, they get really big, so we have fish in our populations over 18. Uh, they're an opportunistic feeder, commonly feeding on uh, overabundant uh, quote unquote rough fish. Now, that's not the right term anymore, but it's one that's often, often used uh, primarily on feeding on buffaloes and perch. Uh, and despite uh, such a uh, interesting life history, they're kind of their, I like to call them the Rocket Danger field of fishes. They just have not gotten any respect in the way they were. Um, they've been considered a trash fish, uh, often thought to be detrimental to poor fish populations. Um, and this, this, this belief was held for a really long time, both not only just by anglers, but also by managers. Um, and I've got a really good example of, of that on the next slide. Uh, this paper was published in the Transactions of AFS in 1931. Um, the author is uh, a guy by the name of Burr, who was the director of research for the Texas Game Fish and Oyster Commission, which was formerly uh, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, that that outlines electricity as a means of gar fishing carp control. And so there were efforts, uh, not only you know by by anglers to eradicate the you know, you know, over harvest, but but also by agencies to you know, remove the problem with gar and other gar species for. Many, many years. So when you have a species of uh, very uh, low interest or value, both by managers and, and uh, anglers, um, obviously that leads to no management, no data, no regulation. So for years and years and years, these fish were over harvested. A lot of pictures like you see up there in the upper left of, you know, really old, really large alligator gar piled in the back of trucks shot by bow and arrow or what have you, um, and then he dumped uh, little fish and uh, they left to rot. So that that kind of mentality persisted for a very long time. This is actually the electrical gar destroyer that uh, came out of that uh, paper by Burr. But about 2000, there really was a paradigm shift, um, and and that that was pr primarily. Uh, brought about by appreciation of biodiversity in aquatic systems, and also a greater understanding of the role that apex predators play in managing um, the, the, the trophic structure uh, in aquatic systems, and also uh, a changing angler interest. So a lot of anglers started to get away from uh, consumptive uh, fishing and more into sport or trophy oriented fishing, multi-species angler. And that, go ahead. And that led to, uh, a, a lot more publicity about things like the alligator gar or sturgeon and so on and so forth. More TV shows featuring fishing for species like that. Also things like river monsters and shows that brought these, these fish to attention. And this just led um, to a, an, an explosion of interest in fishing for alligator gar in particular. Um, in Texas, 
no, numerous guide services started to pop up. Um, a lot of folks coming to the state because they knew that Texas had good populations of alligator gar still. Uh, the range of alligator gar is not real wide. It's essentially from northern Mexico to eastern uh, Florida along the Gulf Coast ranges and then up into the middle of Mississippi. Um, but a lot of the, the populations in those portions of the range are reduced or um, just in really bad shape. And so it brought a lot of, a lot of uh, popularity and interest in coming to Texas to first be able to English coming from all these different places uh, to try and catch alligator guard. So a lot of these uh, guides started to pop up were booked, you know, eight months out of the year. So in response, um, TPWD actually started to recognize the species and, and, need, and the need for management. And so we set a goal of maintaining our existing quality alligator gar fisheries. We instituted the first regulation. Can you speak a little bit louder? louder we're just having a little louder. trouble hearing you on the Facebook. No, okay. you're good. All right. Um, we instituted the first regulation. I feel like I'm louder than Joe. <laughs> I know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we instituted the first regulation on alligator gar, uh, which was one per day statewide in 2009, um, and made them a priority species for the collection data across the state and also monitoring our stocks. One river in particular, or system in particular, uh, is the Trinity River, which you'll see here kind of outlined in, in the blue. Um, it's our premier alligator gar fishery in Texas. It's pretty well known. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Um, it essentially runs from Dallas to Houston and, and then dumps into Galveston Bay. Uh, it's, it's a relatively large, obviously, system. Uh, nothing in Texas is very small. So uh, 860 kilometer main stem or roughly 420 miles. Um, but it's got limited, act, limited public access. A lot of it runs through, uh, through um, private land, uh, and, and so the, the access is limited. Um, because of this, uh, the, 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 the popularity of this fishery, uh, our, our commission um, instituted special regulations on the system in September of 2019. It has a 48-inch maximum size limit, um, and one per day statewide limit still applies. And then we have a lottery draw for uh, 150 tags um, that uh, are good for an oversized fish um, that are given out once a year. And it's one of our, uh, it's a system that was in fact priority for us to monitor the population. And the way we would monitor uh, alligator gar is through these use of these multi-filament gill nets. Um, they are number 21 twine, and if any of you have kids that play soccer, then, uh, or kids that play soccer or play soccer, um, this is the same mesh that they use on a soccer goal. It's the only thing that's been found to really hold alligator gar of all sizes really well. Um, so we, use, we, we have multi-panels, uh, mesh, experimental type nets, um, roughly three and a half uh, inch to uh, five and a half inch mesh. And we use a weighted design, which, which means that the panels aren't exactly all the same size after you take into account selectivity of the various mesh sizes. Maximizes our retention in the total length range that we can sample and get the various representation that we can get of the population of the alligator. When we've done the work on the size selectivity of these nets and found that you know we're pretty effective and we have high retention um, from about 1,200 to about 2,100 millimeter total length. So essentially the whole adult population uh, plus the new recruits coming in. So we, we feel like we can uh, get a good, uh, it's a representative sample of the population. So it's, it's a great tool for monitoring. Problem lies in um, that we still don't catch a lot of fish in these nets. This is a study we did in Choke Canyon Reservoir that did a, a number of different strategies in order to catch fish from a passive predator, which essentially is lie in wait, keep the nets out, wait for fish to come to them, all the way to an aggressive predator where we're looking for surfacing fish, find surfacing fish, and set our nets on them. So uh, you can see that even on the, the best we could do uh, was about five fish per hour. In, in a reservoir setting, but when you actually go ahead, when you actually look at our catch rates in a river setting, which would be the Trinity River, we're down in like the two to point two to point three fish per hour. So it's really hard for us to get uh, get fish. And what that's um, typically, go ahead. What that typically is 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 caused by is the fact that the river is pretty hydrologically variable. We're really good at catching those fish when the flows are low, um, because you get uh, nice 
like in this dark blue here, you get this, you get nice cool setups. Fish congregate in these pools where the, the flow is low. We can actually set these nets that will hold in the current and we can catch fish. Problem lies in is when you get bank flow conditions as these flows start to come up, everything gets really fast, the fish spread out, they're hard for us to find places that the nets will hold. And then we can catch some at really high flows because you get these backwater channels and stuff that fill up and that's where you're uh, the places you can put fish. But generally we're limited to the, the low flow areas where we're really effective. So we have a lot of problems, like lots of problems, sorry. Um, it's a big river system, um, limited access, about one rent per 60 kilometers of river, uh, dynamic flow conditions that we have to take uh, into consideration, which ends up in a position where we have low and variable catch. It's pretty inefficient for us to get our hands on fish. We gotta have a pretty good size sample size to be able to set that trend over time and monitor. So we needed an altern alternative approach. So we began this guide-based tagging program in June of 2019. Um, so we're in our third, going into our third year, uh, where we've, we've uh, worked with these guys and provided them a tagging kit that you see here in the picture. Essentially it's T-bar anchor tags. Uh, they're individually numbered. They have our phone number on them if, if a non-participating uh, angler were to catch one. Uh, tagging guns, spare needles, and data sheets we provided to these, uh, these guides. And in the, in the data sheet, we provide them an instruction manual, which they can use to, you know, uh, consult when they, they have a question about whether they should do this or do that, what do they do with the recap, so on and so forth. We included YouTube video links in there. Um, we asked them to watch those so that they could actually see how to properly tag um, the fish and make sure that the tag is anchored. Um, and, then, uh, and then we provided the data sheets. Um, like you've heard earlier, keeping things simple is really important. Uh, while we would like to get a lot more data out of these guys, um, we keep it really simple. We essentially have the tag number, the total length, and then they can provide us a location uh, where they caught it. It may be the closest ramp, it may be a particular mean location, and some of the guys put GPS coordinates, so on and so forth. And then the most important thing I wanted to point out is we, we started doing this where when they fill this page with data, which in a day's time they usually do one page, um, I have my phone number here. Took it off. <laughs> um, but uh, but we ask them to just when they fill that page out, snap a picture of it and they text it to me. So I have the data that quick. That way we don't run into problems with um, data getting lost uh, or you know them being lackadaisical about turning the data in. So it's a really quick way. And I just save it to a file and I have it. So, so, so far, here's where we're at. We've got uh, 12 guides on the river that are fishing. This is actually Chris Moody, one of our guides. Um, they've, they've been able to tag 2,067 fish uh, or records actually, um, because there are some recaps in there. Um, so 1,988 individuals. Uh, 79 recaptures so far, which is pretty low, but we think that this population is really robust. Everything suggests that there's a lot of fish out there. And so we're still trying to get that critical mass where our recap rates start going up, but you can see it's starting to happen now a little bit. Go ahead. Um, and this is kind of where the, the rubber hits the road for us. When we look at that rate of catch for us being about 2 to 0.2 to 0.3 per hour, if we would have been put the, the effort in to, to tag 2,000 plus fish, it would have been about 8,000 hours of our step time, which is 3.8 years of full-time employment, which is not gonna happen. Um, so it's been super effective in terms of getting the data. <clears throat> what we've actually put in, probably about 20 hours, just my time managing, administering, putting the kids together, fielding the data um, and entering data. The only really negative, if you want to even call it that, and I, I, I hate to even use that word, is the fact that uh, we had some inqu increased equipment cost. Obviously, if we would have been doing this ourselves, we would have probably spent about 500 on, on tags and guns. Um, whereas, you know, you got spend quite a bit more to have that number of, of equipment for that many guides, but that's really awful cheap for the amount of data we're getting. So real quick, I wanted to touch on, you know, like it was also said this morning about quantity of data versus quality of data. And I, I wanted to show that, uh, I wanted to look at whether we're getting quality data as well. So you can see here, uh, you have gillnet data in blue, 
um, and angler data, angler supply data here in, in uh, orange. Go ahead. You can see uh, at the, the uh, smaller size classes, Remember again, our selectivity of our nets really starts to kick in where we can sample is about 1,200. So you can see that they're sampling um, the, the smaller size classes better than we are able to, which is good because we can get next is recruitment relatively quick um, there. Uh, but they're recruiting to both gears roughly, um, fully recruiting both gears roughly about the same size, which is good. So that's comparable. And then the most important thing, go ahead, that we want to monitor, obviously, the trophy oriented fishery is the older fish in the population. So you can see that their data and our data are very closely meshed um, in these larger size classes. So to wrap up, um, our benefits, ultra low cost, low maintenance monitoring for uh, this fishery. We're getting voluminous data, relatively speaking. Um, and that'll be really important as we get critical mass to, to feed data hungry models, market capture models. Um, and to be able to do trend detection over time. The added benefits, this, this one is really big for me. Um, the constituent relationships that we've developed with these guides have been huge. Um, we find out a lot of information on what's going on on the river just outside of the data, just because we've got these relationships going. And they will text me and say, hey, you know, I found some dead fish that were bow shot or you know, all kinds of different stuff. Um, the trust in the data is another one. So when you go to, to the commission with regulation changes or you have, you know, you're talking about, hey, we're seeing a decline in this, that, and the other, these guys are the ones collecting the data. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for them to, they understand what they're collecting, right? So it's hard for them to, to refute anything because it's their own, their own information. Um, and they don't, they, they really want, they're really genuine in, in wanting to know what's going on because it's their livelihood. So, uh, so it's been really good. The other thing has been really important is the client outreach that comes with that. So not just a relationship with a guy, but when they have a client on board and they catch a recap, a lot of times they'll text me immediately, like, hey, are you in the office? I say, yeah, and like, my client caught this fish, can you tell us the history of it? So I'll look it up and I'll do that. Yeah, this was originally tagged two years ago. It was you know, 68 inches and they're like, oh, it's 69 inches now. And the client's wondering why they grow so slow. Well, here's all this other information. And so they get a, a much greater appreciation. So it's really a win-win scenario for us. Um, I just want to take a minute to uh, thank all the guides out in our program. Um, these guys really know what they're doing. So if you want to come to Texas and fish alligator gar, I would highly recommend any one of these. Um, they've been great for, uh, this program and we hope to continue this relationship with them for many years to come. And with that, I'll take any questions you have. That's a great talk, thank you. Um, I grew up in East Texas and okay. I remember like alligator bar being seen as a trash. Uh -huh. You mentioned the paradigm shift. And like now you look on social media and everything and that's you know, exactly what you said. It's right. It's for, yeah. It's for fish. Was it just kind of maybe chicken and egg type of deal, but was there anything specifically that drove the paradigm shift you're talking about other than just kind of general appreciation of the fish? I think that's probably a question that's greater than just alligator car. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's it's social media. It's you know interest in science and, and you know uh, Solomon is probably a good one to talk on. on this. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, Solomon does a lot of work with with uh, you know charismatic megafauna and social media angles, and giving people interest in in uh, getting people interested in, in fishes like alligator gar. And uh, I, I think it's just, it's been that, it's been a combination of the appreciation for biodiversity and, and uh, you know, these, these like shark week and that kind of thing that they're, these apex predators focusing on these apex predators and what they actually do. And then the whole angler side of it of, of destination fishing and, and trophy fishing and, uh, and multi species of anglers of species lists like people have bird lists, you know, deeper before. So, um, I think it's a combination of things. It's, it's been very profound. Then, so Absolutely. You guys have been yeah, good job. Thank you. Okay. Any 
Thanks, Lisa. Oh, um, Rick, Dobbs, I have a quick question about like the the guides and the angling. So because Ellie, there are a huge fish, I'm, I'm assuming they're probably you know, a hard fight and take a while. Do you know if there's any issues with like stress or mortality after angling, anything like that? Um, no. Uh, the data suggests, so in the, in the recaps, we're seeing fish, even though the recap numbers are low right now, and uh, but we're seeing fish, some fish even being caught two and three times, four times. I think we have one fish just been caught four times already. Um, and so, and the other thing is, um, there's they're out there a lot, and they would see their 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 mortalities, you know, floating. They're right. you know they're pretty obvious when they're floating down the river. So uh, they have reported a few, and they'll tell us, hey, uh, you know, scratch this from the database because I found it dead or whatever. But I mean, it's you know like. Maybe 2,000 fish, I maybe have two or three that, that I don't have. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that shout out. Too. Happy to chat about that. <laughs> shout um, out. Yeah. But that's a great program you have in Texas with the anglers and the guys, and you guys work with Bob Bots. Um, and uh, how would you maybe transfer that to someplace like Louisiana, where we don't have as much of a, you know, a catch and release fishery? It's mainly, you know, straight up harvest fishery, but we have a population that's almost as healthy as Texas. But how do you think, you know, what might be some ways we could strategize to transfer that over to Louisiana where we could give, let's say, guides or anglers, you know, that type of kit to start collecting that kind of data? Because you all are way far ahead of us with the progressive uh, regulations and everything. And I'd be right. to chat about that afterwards. But anything yeah. that comes to mind? So you so your your fishery is still basically harvest or yes. <laughs> you don't have any haven't developed the there's no regulation on alligator guard right fishing. but I mean there there hasn't been like a like a rod reel catch and release fishery takeoff yet or not really is it because there's something all over to Texas yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> sense them our way yeah right yeah that that's a little tougher to do you know when your endpoint is in the freezer or whatever it's just hard to develop the tagging program or you can get market cap data but I'll chew on it. You, you and I can talk afterwards. You okay. just need to get some guides doing catch and release. Yeah. Yeah. How does your uh, catch per hour relate compared to what the gillnets compared to what the guides can do? Oh, I mean, it's kind of apples and oranges. But. It is. Um, I haven't done a direct comparison per se, um, but they're they're you know, I would say on average on a good day we make catch five fish. When you have the guides out, if they're all out fishing, I mean, they can get 50 to 100. What? Well, Q Yeah. An individual guy can get somewhere in the neighborhood. Sometimes they catch five, sometimes they catch 10, sometimes they have a banner day and catch 15 or 20. But yeah, it's a lot more. All right, time to uh, wrap up. <laughs>